particular series of lectures. And I hope by now some things have become clear. I, have, I do these things in three divisions. I try to deal with three questions every session. One is the discussion of Luther's theology, certain aspects of Luther's theology. The second is a study of the texts, Luther's own writings, and an attempt to understand what he is teaching us in these selected writings. And the third is a reading in articles that I have written which try to relate Luther's theology to the contemporary situation. Contemporary over a period of 50 years, as a matter of fact, because there are articles in there that are wrote 50 years ago. But uh, in each instance, I have tried not just to talk about Luther in his time, but also try to relate Luther to our time. Obviously, the, this la last effort is the most uh, controversial because, first of all, the time in which we have changes and the meaning of Luther for a particular time is uh, subject to the particular understanding of the person who tries to do that. So I hope you understand that this last part is particularly uh, subject to modification by you or anybody who is trying to do the same thing in a different setting. Uh, this is not uh, uh, Luther speaking, but a Lutheran who is trying to apply Luther to a particular time. And the, the change in time is very apparent in, uh, in the articles. Some of them are clearly the result of the situation right during and after the Second World War, and some are the result of the situation in which we find ourselves today. It's a completely different setting uh, that uh, you will see reflected. Now, today I want to talk about Luther's understanding of history. In these 50 years that I've been dealing with Luther, Luther's understanding of history has become more and more interesting for many people uh, because uh, as you know, all kinds of uh, writers, secular writers, have dealt with Luther as an important historical figure who, in their opinion, caused or at least helped to or contributed to the development of National Socialism. A number of books have been written, and ever once in a while, even now, somebody writes something like that, uh, in which the effort is being made to blame the development of National Socialism on Luther. It's always very strange because, you know, Hitler and Goebbels and these people, none of them were Lutherans, <coughs> not even none of them were and of course, Bavaria, where the whole thing is Austria and Bavaria are not known as hotbeds of Lutheranism. Uh, neither in Austria, in Austria, the Lutherans are a very small minority, and that's you know, where Hitler got his start, um, and where he picked up his antisemitism. And uh, in Bavaria, as you know, during people like that came from, it's not exactly a hotbed of Lutheranism either, although there are more Lutherans there now than there were uh, 50 years ago because of the, all these displaced Germans that were resettled in the area from, from, from some of them from Lutheran country. But um, people like Shira, a very influential writer who wrote on the uh, rise and fall of National Socialism, uh, blamed 
quite in quite straightforward way. Uh, Luther uh, for Hitler. Um, I deal with that at some length in Faith Active and Love, of which there's a little summary, but it doesn't deal with the analysis of, of, of that particular problem that I make in a book called Faith Active and Love, which is in your library. In fact, my dissertation that I wrote at the Union was an attempt to uh, dispel the notion that there is any direct relationship between, between Luther and Hitler. Uh, in fact, I think the uh, relationship is negative, particularly if you keep in mind that those countries who, were, 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 um, who had only Lutherans in them were the countries where National Socialism had practically no followers at all. And there were more followers of National Socialism in Switzerland than in Norway or Sweden. And as you know, the one country where practically no Jews were killed was Denmark. And that was because the Danes were notified by a Lutheran assistant in the German embassy that the Nazis planned to pick up all Danish Jews and send them off to a concentration camp. And the Danes took all the Jews, took, put them in little rowboats and rowed them over to Sweden the night before. And when the Nazis came to pick up the Jews in Denmark, there weren't many left, which was a matter of considerable chagrin to them. The guy who betrayed the Nazi plot, however, survived the uh, event and was the first post-war ambassador of Germany to Denmark. There are many stories that we're going to tell about. But so I, I think this is, uh, this is a, a bad interpretation of history. But uh, Luther did many things that uh, involved him in uh, a new view of history. Uh, for one thing, he thinks that history is one of the best teachers uh, that human beings have uh, for that part of our life that is not directly dependent on revelation. And we learn more from history than we learn from law books and uh, rules because here law and experience are connected. He writes on that some length in his uh, treatise on good works. Even as late as 1538, he says it is a very important thing to study history because history gives you examples of how events develop and how God acts in all of you, all human events. Darum sind auch die Historienschreiber die allernützlichsten Leute. The writers of history are the most useful of all people. And the best teachers, and you cannot honor them sufficiently. This is in a preface to a history book that he uh, uh, wanted to have published and which he, he uh, recommended. And he criticized some of the historians of his own time that they didn't have the courage 
to tell it how it really is, and that they wrote history uh, to please the people in power, and thus confuse them, confuse people, and give them false, uh, a false view of what really happened. To understand Luther's youth history, you have to remember what I mentioned to you before, that he thinks as God working behind masks, and uh, that God works in a hidden way. He talks about these masks of God, the larvae, they eat. And, uh, Though history is dependent on God, it is never e easily possible to see God's hand with our unaided eyes. And he uses the, history, the historical part of the Old Testament as examples of God revealing himself in such uh, uh, a hidden way. God uh, deals with the people of the world as if they were toys. And he likes to quote uh, Proverbs 8.31 and uh, sees in the story of Joseph in, and his brothers a, an analogy to the way in which God deals with people. Joseph is helping his brothers, but they don't realize that he is really doing this. They the help that he gives, he gives in such an indirect way that they are scared to death uh, at first. He deals with history also in the last of his major works, a commentary on Genesis, and uh, works through the stories of Genesis from this particular uh, point of view that God's justice is behind all historical events, but it isn't easily visible. All of creation is a tool in God's hands, but uh, it isn't easy to see it because God remains hidden and incomprehensible in history. Uh, by the way, a famous German poet, uh, Friedrich Schiller, uh, picked up from his, uh, the notion that his promise, he was a historian besides being a great dramatist. He made a, his living as a history professor. But Schiller said, Die Weltgeschichte ist das Weltgericht. The history of the world is the judgment of God of the world. Ah. And so God is behind everything in history, even those events that we cannot understand at all. It is naive to assume, Luther suggests, that you will, that the, the pious will be uh, well off and the godless it will have a terrible time. Um, he admits that uh, God's sins have to suffer, but that insight must not destroy faith in God. Indeed, it should strengthen it, uh, because you see it always in relationship to Jesus Christ. And a God who would be completely transparent, wouldn't be God at all. A God who is completely transparent is an idol and a creation of uh, the human mind. 
the true God reveals himself by the very fact that he stays hidden, that we never can completely understand what God does in history. And thus, while natural reason cannot understand God, it has, it gets sort of an inkling of God. Luther says sometimes, natural reason knows that there is a God, but who this God is, it never knows. And uh, there is this tension, this ambiguity. And for this reason, natural human reason does not really understand history if it sees success, it uh, thinks this is God's gracious gift, and when it's his failure, it is the rejection. But as Luther knows from reading Job, but also reading the story of the rich farmer, that success is not necessarily all that great a guarantee that you are experiencing God's favor. It's a misunderstanding to eat, to put a good fortune and grace on the same level. Good fortune, Glück is uh, not a necessary sign of God's grace. It only shows God's rule. And God rules, of course. I mean, nobody wins even the lottery without God. I dare tell you my lottery joke, yes, I did. <coughs> About the man who did this. Jewish gentleman who goes to the synagogue every day to pray to, that he wants to win the lottery, I haven't told you that, goes every day. And the people get tired of him, but he does it every day. Lord, please let me win the lottery. And one day after a month of this, there's a booming voice in the synagogue that says, Goldberg, Give me a break. Buy a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the, this is, of course, a cooperation, and I don't think Luther would have approved of this particular <laughs> But, but the, the, uh, the, the idea is, for Luther, uh, nothing happens without God. But we don't always see God's plan in all these things that happen. Uh, in all the events of, that we see, our unaided reason never really understands God's purpose. Even when we deal with special revelation, the revelation in Jesus Christ, it is, as you know, for Luther, a revelation that for the unbeliever is totally uh, obscure. The baby in that manger in Bethlehem, that man being crucified, that doesn't reveal God. Um, for the unaided human reason, this is totally incomprehensible. But what happens, what God does in Christ is characteristic for God. God kills to make alive. He rejects 
in order to accept. He, Luther loves all these paradoxes just as his favorite teacher, the Apostle Paul, and uh, works with them, these contraries, as he calls them, that go counter to the expectations that human beings would, uh, would have. But uh, our senses do not give us a clear vision of God in history. Faith and unbelief see history differently. The unbelieving person wants to penetrate the events immediately and see an immediate positive result. He wants to read the truth from what happens in history. He wants to read the truth directly from the headlines in the newspaper, we might say. The believer knows that he cannot draw such easy conclusions as long as things are still developing. He knows that God is not easily understood, but he does not become angry with God and does not become an unbeliever. He waits for God and sees God when God has passed. Again, Luther quotes this passage where Moses sees God after he has gone by him. He doesn't see God face to face. He sees God's back. And so, uh, history does not disclose God e easily when you have enough perspective on it. Later on, you can see it. Uh, faith is satisfied to see God's back. And so, God's activity in history is accessible to human beings only through faith. And uh, even in the interpretation of history, Luther says it is faith that is the key. And this is how he interprets the Psalms, uh, very early in his career, he, he describes the psalmist as seeing, sitting on the roof of a house. And everybody, he says, the whole world is like a house. And everybody's asleep in this house. And uh, the psalmist, for him, the believer, sits on the roof of this house now, and uh, he's on the roof, not in heaven. <laughs> he isn't in the world, sleeping with these people down in beneath, and he isn't out of this world either. But he is only the sky above him. And he lives in, the, he says, a, he must live zwischen der Welt, in between these two uh, realms, einsam und im Glauben, uh, lonely and in faith. He sees that that's it, lonely and in faith. That's in his 1517 commentary on seven psalms of repentance. Very early. 
And because God remains God and is never under our control, the historical processes proceed in a manner that seemed to us very peculiar. It is never in the hands of human beings, although God uses human beings. When Luther talks about uh, what he calls the wonder men, these miraculous people that God chooses to get things changed, without whom things would never change. The, these are the tools of God, and these tools don't always know that they are tools of God. They can be somebody like Cyrus, a Persian king, who is somebody God uses to get his work done. I translate Luther now into the 20th century. Luther would be writing today, I'm sure he would have thought of Gorbachev as one of those people who probably considered himself an atheist who God used to change the world. And God uses people to change the world. Uh, but they don't necessarily uh, represent uh, great theological insights. God uses people even if they are themselves not uh, uh, close to him. In this masked ball, in this which the, the, the history of the human race is, God uses all kinds of people. He dances in them, although they may not know who is the one who, whose commandments they fulfill. There is no simple solution. Uh, not, it isn't, if you work hard, then success will be given to you. You might work hard and nothing happens. He does not, he does not have a simple uh, explanation that the, uh, Allah, uh, the, the Protestant work ethic. Uh, Luther is not a Calvinist. <laughs> you can bring that up next time. <laughs> he does not. He does not really believe. You know, in, in, in Calvinism there was this real belief that if you work hard enough, then you can demonstrate that, that you're one of God's elect. Success is a sign of election. Luther can be very eloquent, but failure may be a sign of God's election. That you don't. There isn't any e easy way to say. Uh, if this happens, that shows that I am uh, a, a, a child of God. Uh, terrible things can happen. And in faith, a person may still accept this as, a, as something that uh, engenders faith. God is the ruler of all things, but there is no easily accessible connection between guilt and reconciliation, work and success, justice and victory. But behind it all, God brings about his purposes. Um, he rejects the notion of success as 
the result of obedience. Now, you will see that here is intention with some of the writers of Deuteronomy. My friend James Baldy has always claimed that Max Weber and those people who blame the Calvinists for this simple-minded notion that uh, success is the direct result of obedience to God, that that wasn't fair to the Calvinists. Jim is a Calvinist. He thinks that that is picking up sort of naively something that you get in Deuteronomy where everything that goes wrong with the Jews is immediately attributable to disobedience and if they obey everything goes well. It's much more complicated and it is much more the way in which Isaiah 53 and things like and the suffering servant notion. Uh, Luther is much more in tune with uh, with this uh, far more complex thinking than the notion that if you, uh, let me translate it into American language. The family that prays together stays together. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, would not exactly describe the situation of Mary and Joseph and Jesus. Uh, the, the, uh, the situation doesn't come out as that easily. And in fact, many of the people that push the family that prays together, stays together, do a great injustice to the gospel because all kinds of people then pick up this notion that because they have a child that is born with Down syndrome, that there is something particularly wrong that they did, and there is this cause-effect notion. Uh, there are American Protestants, especially if you have had any contact with some of the Assembly of God people who have do, who make this very direct connection. And I agree with Chris Spalding that Calvin never did. And this kind of this kind of uh, simple identification of uh, obeying the law, God's law, and prosperity uh, does not really describe what you learn by reading the Bible. Because if you read the Bible, you find that all kinds of people that obeyed God had a terrible time, including the most uh, significant illustration of it all, Job. It wasn't that Job was a particularly bad man. In fact, the Bible says he was a good man. And he had to learn that uh, Norman Vincent Peale is not necessarily a clue, or his imitators in Southern California are not necessarily a clue to the way God acts in his, or in the life of human beings. Luther says we must let God be God. And uh, this is central for his theology. God doesn't have to be just. What God does is just. Justice is not something that exists outside of God. For Luther, he doesn't have to live up to human expectations. What God does, we will learn sooner or later, is just, even though at the time it happens, it may seem incredibly unjust, or as Luther likes to call it, Isaiah 55 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And your ways are not my ways, says the Lord. But as the heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts.
And that brings us to the next topic, which I will, however, not begin until I have given you a chance to raise questions. That was Isaiah what? What we ask? Okay. Isaiah 55, 8. Right. Isaiah 55, verses 8 following. Yes, sir. Do you think that uh, John, Mo John Montgomery's article on uh, re uh, sure and uh, the, the Nazis and uh, fabricated Luther? Uh, I haven't read it, but uh, knowing John Montgomery, I would think he's probably right. And the, uh, the book, The Fabricated Luther, have you read that one? No. I should have, but I haven't. I haven't actually, I haven't seen it. If I'd seen it, I would have read it. But, uh, but I mean, the, the, story, the, the interpretation of Luther, that Shira, Shira, Shira and all these people, it just, it just doesn't, doesn't meet the criteria of historical research. Yes? Uh, is uh, Luther the people's backgrounds that are writing these things, uh, writing these accounts of history about Luther being? Well, Shira was a journalist. There was a guy by I mean, McGovern, uh, not, not the guy who ran for, uh, for president, but the uh, professor of Western University, who wrote a book called From Luther to Hitler. And he was uh, sort of a historian. And, uh, but I think, I mean, they, they, they always, you know, they talk about religion, then, then they discard it as a factor. I mean, <laughs> Goebbels was educated by the Jesuits. Not, no great spokesperson for Lutheran theology. And so, so you, you have to make allowance for the, the reality of, of, of the German situation. And most of the people that uh, followed the Nazis uh, were not particularly religious people. And even those who were, <laughs> it's a funny bunch. It's a funny combination. Uh, Immanuel Hirsch, uh, very brilliant German theologian, but an extreme liberal. Yes? Do you think the assault on uh, historical figures that are uh, honorable in Christianity is a demonic thing? Well, of course. I mean, that's the attempt, a demonic attempt to, to misread and misinterpret uh, I wouldn't do the other thing either. I wouldn't turn it around. I would, that would be unfaithful to Luther too. The position of the German church under the Nazis was extremely ambiguous. I wish I could say that all the German Lutheran church or the German Catholic church stood up like a man against it, but they didn't. By and large, they said, well, it will come out in the war. They said, we'll see how it goes, and did not have the courage. There were people that had this courage. Some of them were killed. The most famous of them is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was certainly a convinced Lutheran. But uh, there were others, and some stayed in jail for, for, for the whole time. Uh, Martin Niemöller was acquitted by a German court of all the accusations made against him. And as he came out of, from, the, from the court, uh, he was arrested by the secret police and put into a concentration camp and didn't come out until 1945. But on the other hand, as a former German submarine commander, they didn't kill him. Niemöller always was treated better than most other inmates of concentration camps. And he stayed alive. Uh, he wasn't involved in the plot against Hitler. Bonhoeffer was, but they had no evidence. So they killed him without evidence. And they killed him a few days before he would have been uh, liberated by the Americans. But, uh, but they were very courageous people. I can, could tell you sort of family stories. My, Uncle uh, Frederick Kretschmar, 
um, was a pastor. He didn't leave Germany like my father did. He was a pastor who served a relatively small congregation in Germany, where everybody, of course, knew him. And he, had, he was a veteran of the First World War. And uh, even the people, the police, were members of this congregation. And uh, I remember when the confessing church, the, you know, the anti-Nazi German church, when they were reading a statement uh, against some of the uh, laws that had been just introduced from the Volta, they were all supposed to be arrested. And on Monday, my uncle came to my grandmother, visiting her as he did, I was his wont, on Monday. And she said, she greeted her son by saying, why aren't you in jail? But I said, I'm sorry, but in my town, nobody arrests me. <laughs> The police had the door to arrest him, but he, they wouldn't do it, you see. That was one of those little towns where, you know, the, the system didn't, wasn't infallible. And, and so, but his, his mother was very disapproving. <laughs> <laughs> she felt he ought to be in jail. Uh, often, as many as, in, in Silesia, as many as 300 pastors were in jail on the, on the Monday after they had read something that, they were released again. I mean, they weren't. They were. They, they weren't built in gas chambers. But uh, but there was this kind of conflict, and there were thousands who didn't do anything. She said that was, who, who took, took no position at all. I, it's it's the, 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 the unfair thing about the German church situation is that these people are measured by completely different standards from the way we measure ourselves in our own country. Not everybody is cut out to be a hero. And some people just uh, walk away from situations like that. And you know, nobody uh, realized how bad it would get. It got worse all the time. You know, most people believed that it would pass. They didn't, they didn't expect it to end up in this murder of six million people. Some people did. My dad did. He thought it would get that bad. But uh, he certainly was the exception to the rule. And I take no credit whatsoever. I only did what my father told me to do. And I, I probably would have, would have uh, uh, stayed in Germany if my dad had left in 1933. He couldn't wait. <laughs> he didn't hang around. So I, I think the, the, the problem with all that is that if you want to read it a certain way, you, know, you, can, you can adduce evidence from both sides. I think somebody who says the German church was courageous to the death against the Nazis wouldn't tell the truth either. And it was a far more complicated thing. Einstein once said that that he expected uh, the universities to stand up against Hitler. He expected the courts to stand up against Hitler. And then he said, to my great surprise, the only people that stood up against Hitler were the churches. And they didn't stand up that very courageously. But comparatively speaking. But, uh, and, and, and uh, strange situation happened in these concentration camps where I would say the development of ecumenism in the second half of the 20th century was very largely the result that so many people met in concentration camps. Catholics and Lutherans and Reform were, were in jail together as a great unifying. And, uh, but as far as Luther is concerned, there isn't a simple solution 
You can't read off God's justice from your history book or from your newspaper. Because God is available to us in faith and not by reading history. Although God is behind this. Now, any other comments or questions? I would like to say something about the doctrine of Christ. And Christ in relation to scripture. Luther did not try to come up with a new kind of crystal of Christology. Luther retained, for all practical purposes, the Christology of the medieval Catholic Church. Uh, in fact, he has a notable lack of interest to deal with questions which are true enough, but which he doesn't think are helpful or necessary in the proclamation of the gospel. While the great medieval theologians start talking about Christ by talking about his pre-existence before his birth, while they talk about the doctrine of the Trinity, they talk about the two natures. Luther doesn't deal with these subjects, except a couple of times when he deals with the sacrament. Essentially, he talks about Christ in the context of what we call soteriology in the context of salvation. He talks about the work of Christ, assuming all the time that what the church teaches about the person of Christ is true. But he does not uh, elaborate this truth. His objection to the Christology of the medieval church was mainly because he felt it was too deeply involved in philosophy. It was so affected by philosophical thought that he felt that the scholastics are quoted in here talk about divine things like uh, Shoemaker talks about leather. He felt that uh, they acted as if they really understood the internal workings of God. He said they lack a true reverence for the secrets of God. Um, this comes out already in the, if you have read any of that very early material in the, in the, in the Psalm lectures of 1530 to 1516, where he's totally within the context of his own tradition. Uh, he just doesn't like the way in which these people know what's going on inside God's mind. And they, he wished they would talk less about it. For him, the doctrine of Christ is the doctrine of the crucified Christ. Yes? Um, backing up a little bit, you said that he wasn't so much concerned with medieval questions like the pre-existence of Christ, the nature of the Trinity, and the doctrine of the two natures. But when you say doctrine of the two natures, you're, you're talking about the philosophical yeah, discussion, right, right. not the fact of the no, 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 he denied, he believes in his prayers. He believes all these things. He just 
you don't find him elaborating this. He's, see, Luther assumes that the church hasn't been all wrong. You know, you saw that in some of your readings. He, he, he felt that the notion that we have to start from scratch as if for the last uh, uh, 1,200 years the church had been totally uh, wrong. No, he doesn't believe that. He, he thinks that Chalcedon and Nicaea and all these things are, did say it as it was. But he did, didn't, he did not elaborate that. We find very little discussion of these questions in Luther because for him, the center of his theological concern is the Christ, the crucified Christ. The Christ who is uh, crucified for human beings. Scholasticism uses reason and revelation as parallel sources for its theological articulation. Luther is, concentrates on the cross, as you saw already in his, in his uh, uh, disputation against scholastic theology. And uh, he doesn't mind that talking about the cross is annoying to people. It's that they, they would rather talk about more triumphal things. They don't want to hear of the cross. It's foolishness and the stumbling block. And as I said, you find that already in the very, very beginning of his theological work, before the conflict with Rome. And the unity of God's purpose is most clearly revealed in the revelation in Christ. He is the only Savior. He is always, from the very beginning, the Holy One and the Righteous One. And His holiness is not the result of His works or His achievements, but Christ is holy. Justice Righteousness, that Luther's term is Gerechtigkeit. Just as righteousness is the innermost essence of Christ. And because he is what he is, he can do what he does. And he sees us as the way in which we must understand our own uh, salvation. In the life of the Christian, the life of Christ is repeated. He says, as Jesus Christ is conceived by the Holy Spirit, every believer is justified and reborn without any human work alone through God's grace and the activity of the Holy Spirit. Now you see here suddenly the teaching of the virgin birth is not a teaching about something odd that happened. It's really the paradigm the virgin birth is the paradigm of the way in which God acts in Christ and in us. In a sense, we are all the result of the activity of uh, God and not the result of any natural processes that we have uh, 
engaged in. We are miraculously justified and born again. Through Christ, God makes us holy and just. And for only he who is justified is able to live a just life. I, 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 I don't know that I can get everybody understanding. Uh, Luther, of course, never denies the virgin birth. <laughs> what he does is to apply, he, he makes it into something that, that we are participating in. We are also, through God the Holy Spirit, born again, just without any activity on our part. And so the virgin birth, instead of becoming something that uh, you have to believe in order to be orthodox, it becomes something that is the very way in which God deals with us as a result of what he has done in Jesus Christ. I mean, the, 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 the activity, the activity of God in Christ, the blessed, the, the, the birth of Christ through the Blessed Virgin, this activity of Christ is a paradigm of our own salvation without any uh, human uh, contribution. Uh, you have to, you have to understand that, that he's, he sees it as a way of denying human work. He sees the virgin birth as a testimony to grace. Uh, as I see it. <laughs> I mean, to me, I've always uh, defended uh, against all the people who thought I was a little peculiar, always defended the importance of the doctrine of the virgin birth, uh, not because it is a story that demonstrates God's power. Well, if that, that's too simple. I mean, in, a, in a time in which Pallas Athene jumped fully armed out of the head of Zeus, the story about a woman giving birth to a baby in a stable is not very impressive. If you want to come up with a more impressive story, I can think of a hundred more impressive stories than, than this particular story. The point of the story is not impression, making impressive sin. In fact, the story was from the very beginning used uh, uh, to embarrass Christians. You know, virgin birth are never particularly believable stories. And, uh, but, but Luther sees it completely differently. He sees it as a, as a sign of grace. <coughs> as a sign of the, the, the miraculous way in which God takes us and we are all sort of in debt uh, to, to this uh, uh, virgin birth as an example of how God uh, allows us to be born again. It's, it's, it's an amazing, well, I, I, I have always hoped that people could understand why the virgin birth is not something that we defend in order to be medieval. It is something that we glory in because it shows us how God's grace operates without any contribution on our part. Well, uh, probably I should quit here for a while, otherwise everybody has to walk away and, uh, <laughs> and give you a chance and give you a chance to use the facilities that are available. The, uh, Concerning the order of public worship, he is trying to uh, go a step further in uh, reorganizing the service of the church. Now this is 1523. And uh, the problem that he sees is, he gives three things on page 445, 
God's word has been silenced and only reading and singing remain in the churches. Now remember when he says reading and singing, he really doesn't mean what you and I mean by reading and singing. He means Latin reading and Latin singing. So that what he is up against is that there's nothing going on there except sort of a mystification of the people. What they, they are up against is they don't know what's going on. They, they have no idea what's going on. And uh, in fact, you know, some people groove on not knowing what's going on. I don't care. <laughs> I have a friend. I can't quote him, I think. He would not be embarrassed. He is probably the most famous uh, Lutheran sociologist of religion in America. His name is Peter Berg. Peter Berg said to me, I don't go to a Lutheran church anymore. I cannot stand this penny anti sociology that I get from the book. I can't do that anymore. I said, Peter, you, you go to church. He says, I, I, he says, I go to a, <coughs> to a Romanian Orthodox church where I don't understand a word that's going on, but it is a very nice service, and nobody in, in, in insults my intelligence. And uh, now, I do not recommend that. <laughs> Peter is a good friend of mine, and, and uh, he, I do not recommend his solution to the problem, but uh, all of us may have been in situations where we would have felt better if we hadn't understood a word that's going on. The, 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 my, one of my big problems in going to church is, of course, that I cannot not listen to the sermon. I must listen to the sermon. It's, it's, I've been trained to listen to the sermon. I've listened to innumerable sermons, and often I envy the people that sit next to me, except my wife, of course, she doesn't sit too. But often people sit next to me who, as soon as the sermon <coughs> starts, switch off. And when, only when the pastor says, Amen, are they back. <laughs> <laughs> they have learned totally. You could, on a bet, they couldn't tell you what the song's all about. And, and there are people like that. If you haven't met them, you don't know your congregation very well. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and Luther, of course, was facing a situation in which most people really got very little that they understood out of anything. They got sort of a sense of the drama. And, of course, people were ringing bells and using uh, incense. And so the stu there was stuff going on, you know but not something that you had to pay attention to with your ears. Uh, Paul Tillich always said, the Roman Catholic worship addresses the eye, and uh, while uh, Lutheran worship addresses the ear. And, uh, and that's why you could have these huge churches, because you didn't have to understand anything anyway, because the, before loud speaking, <laughs> because it was a drama that, that mattered. Now, Luther was aware of that, and he tried to uh, get the worship back to what he thought was the New Testament practice of having understandable services. That people, that people had some idea what this is all about, what, what is going on here. And, uh, that, and in fact, that's why he tried to get the singing into German, and the reading into German. The joke on that is, of course, and these people come to America and keep it in German when nobody can understand German anymore. And that is really a joke on Luther. When people, in order to be good Lutherans, do the very thing that he had so hard fought to prevent, namely that people wouldn't understand what's going on. I have preached in many German services in this country, and I remember to this day having preached in German with the perhaps 40 people in the German service, and one man sitting in the balcony. And after the service, it's in Reading, Pennsylvania, 
And after the service, I shake hands with my 40 people and the man in the balcony and ask him something in German. Doesn't understand word. I say, do you understand German? He said, no. Why do you come to the German service? We have an English service uh, an hour earlier. Why don't you come to English? He said, it's so much more beautiful. But yes, I mean, <laughs> there were people that attended the German service not because they understood German better. That would be the only good reason, and that's why I preached in German, because there were some people that understood German better. But the, who, 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 want to, who want this mystification? As a mere fact, there are some people that go to lectures they don't understand. And uh, they are much impressed afterwards because they didn't understand a word. Must have been very profound, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and and so this this there are people that really don't like to understand. And uh, and Luther is addressing that problem when he says, first of all, uh, we have to get this back so that people can understand what's going on. And this he considers the worst abuse, that, that uh, God's word has been silenced. Secondly, instead of that, all kinds of homilies, the only preaching that you got, he felt, and I take his word for it, I wasn't there, the only preaching that he got was these stories that uh, about uh, saints and uh, uh, a funny thing happened to me on the way to church. You know, this, this kind of this kind of stuff was going on, and it had nothing to do with God's word. You can see it in some of the uh, tradition. Uh, <laughs> Gregory the Great who was really a great pope in many ways, and uh, had, he wrote some wonderful things <coughs> that, that nobody reads. <coughs> but he also wrote a collection of the weirdest kind of miracle stories, you know, where you prove God's existence by uh, some woman dropping a, a teapot, and mirac she prays, and miraculously the teapot comes back together again. Luther couldn't stand any of that. He felt this didn't help anybody. Even if it happened, it wouldn't matter. It's a, it, it's a, tr it's, it's the, it's the obsession with trivia. He didn't want people to get up in church and talk about trivial things, and he felt that preaching had become uh, the telling of unchristian fables and lies and legends, hymns and sermons <coughs> that is horrible to see. That, 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 yes, sir. Like the virgin birth of Christ? I mean? Like the virgin birth of our Lord? Would that be no. the type of fables you mean? No. That's a biblical story. The historical reality you mean? It's a biblical story. That's yes. true? Yes. I, I, you weren't here when I talked about it, were you? I talked about the virgin birth for about 10 minutes. Yes, that's why I raised the question. And I said that it didn't happen. Sounded like that's what you were saying. Did you? Did did anybody else hear that? Did I say? I just want to see that you have a peculiar kind of hearing difficulty, <laughs> and I think you need a hearing aid, and 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 that would be useful, uh, an aid that sort of clarifies your hearing, and uh, it, because you know it's, it would be strange if all these people heard me say that I believe in the Virgin Birth, and you heard me say I didn't. That's odd. That's all right. You know, you can hear whatever you want, but I want you to be sure that you you, you realize that there's some kind of communications problem. Okay. No, I didn't hear you say that you that it wasn't historical truth, but you did say that it was something uh, other more. Than, or it was more than that. All kinds of things are historical truth that can do do a thing for us. The the, the, the fact that that uh, that. Uh, uh, the Declaration of Independence was written in 776. It's, it's, it's historical truth, but it doesn't matter. 
in the intended sense is one, though, in Scripture. And the grammatical sense, according to Luther, uh, was foundational. It was the magister uh, at Luke's, at yeah, but, Juan's, yeah, but, at but you see, what he's trying to do with the virgin birth is to say it happened to Mary and it happens to us. That's what he's trying to say. He says, God doesn't just do it once for historical reasons. He did it in order to help us to see how he is born in us and raised for us. And the mere fact that, uh, uh, that, that Jesus was born of the Blessed Virgin, if this does not become something that I believe in, doesn't do me any good. I have to believe it. And, and this, is his, this is his concern, to bring the objective fact, which is true itself, into the life of people for whom it is me often merely something that they say, yes, it's true, that's true. Nothing happens. All kinds of people repeat the Apostles' Creed uh, all the time, and nothing happens. They don't, they don't ever make it their own. This is really, that's the point in Luther that, that I think you have trouble with. That, that he wants more than merely saying it happened. The apostles had trouble with it too. Pardon me? The apostles had trouble with this point too. If you want to say that I'm having trouble with it, uh, so did Paul. What was Paul's trouble? That the events themselves if they did not happen, uh, our faith is in vain. But who said that it didn't happen? That's what you make up. I have never said that. See, your problem is because I think it's more. It happens and then this has happened to you too. It must become part of your faith. That's what upsets you. But I never say it didn't happen. <laughs> Just because I'm not satisfied to repeat 40 propositions and say, now I'm happy, I have to repeat the proposition that they're all true, and they'll go, then go on with my life as if nothing had happened. That's the problem. The problem is that, that Christians very often say yes to all kinds of wonderfully true things, and nothing happens. Wish it weren't so. As you know, I believe the devil believes and knows that it happened. Hasn't done him much good. Or do you think the devil doesn't know that, the, that Jesus was born in the Virgin? You don't think he knows that? Or you, perhaps you don't believe in the devil? <laughs> he exists and he knows. <laughs> uh, that's, you may have a problem there. All right, the, the, because you see, when you don't believe in the devil, then you're really in trouble. Because then he really got you where you want to. The trick of the devil is always to make you not believe in him. They say, there is no devil, that's just a medieval tale. He, I, he wants to say, I have a red suit and a Horses, hopefully, they go around with a pitchfork. That, 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 that uh, when, you, when, when he makes you believe that, then of course he's home free. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the question is not whether this happened, as far as I'm concerned, it did. But the question is, does it have a effect in my life? And that is only possible through grace. My mere assertion that something happens is uh, not enough. Can I, can I raise a question yeah. about this? Good uh, point. I believe he's, he comes at it from one perspective. I'm, I, I want to take a different perspective okay. on this. Um, it's, it, it seems to me so far in, in, Luther, in the reading of Luther, and pretty much in line with what you were saying, it's interesting, you don't see a lot of this in Luther about it 
big discussion of the virgin birth. No. He assumes it. What? Everybody believes it. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. That, that may partially answer my question. But I was going to go on to say, it's, on the other hand, he talks about this, this baby in the manger and yeah. swaddling clothes, which is foolishness, you know, and a stumbling block. Yeah. So I, I guess what my, my whole question is here is that it, as far as Luther is concerned, it seems to me that whether he had been born of a virgin or not would have been potentially irrelevant. If, if God had chosen to do it a different way, he could have. That, that, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it's, it's, it's like it's, it's almost like that's an accident in history. That's, that's, because God chose to do it that way, right. and, and we know that. Yeah. But the point is that it was Christ, and it's, that's the way you get to salvation. Is the, that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And, but, but you see, what I want to avoid is the notion that uh, merely because the birth of Jesus by the Blessed Virgin happened, and I say, yes, it happened, I have understood it. It, there's more I see, it's it's even a different, I, a I different want, twist. I want, yeah. and, and that's, I think, what Luther's always concerned, that we don't get stuck in mere uh, saying, repeating things that have not become our own. And they do not become our own except through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why he says all these things that I quoted, you know, that in, in a sense, Christ who was born of the Virgin Mary has also been be born in us. His what? Be, has to be born in us. Yes? That, that analogy you used earlier about the fact that it, it re-emphasized for Luther the fact that we do nothing, that Mary did nothing. You're right, that's exactly And that that was a great analogy to yeah. use yeah. because everybody believed and understood the virgin birth. Yeah. That God did it. And that's why he could use this analogy because he was talking in a situation where everybody believed in the virgin birth. I don't think there was anybody in Wittenberg who denied the Virgin Birth. So that wasn't a problem in, in, in the 16th century. And I was just going to comment, repeating something without thinking about it is, is not much different from, you know, being able to pronu pronounce a German sentence yeah. and not understand it. It's a similar, not to understand the language. And you see that the sad part is that you often, like, I mean, with the best of attention, the Germans and the Swedes and the Norwegians and all these people that came to this country wanted to be sure that the gospel was going to be preached so that people can understand. And since they understood German and Swedish and Danish, they wanted to be preached. Makes perfect sense to me. The problem is, when people don't understand it anymore, do you keep on doing this or are you now going to translate it into a language that people can understand? And Fortunately, most of our Lutheran people picked that up. And did, only they picked it up, probably 100 years too late. And if they had done it 100 years earlier, the church of the, Luther, the Lutheran churches in America would have twice as many members. Yes. So Luther would have, to put this into Luther's mouth, he would have said, Mary didn't say, oh, I'm pregnant. Mary said, my soul magnifies right. the Lord, and my exactly. spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And that's one, that, that's his wonderful, wonderful prayer. You got it. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you, do you think uh, that Luther, if he was pressed from, uh, from our culture in the 20th century, would go into the mechanics about uh, not having a father, therefore he wasn't connected to a sinful nature? And so forth? Well, I think he believed that. I, I think I think he was a traditionist in the that we call that in theology that sin was uh, carried on, uh, uh, you know, through through uh, uh, inheritance. And the German word for original sin is erbsünde, and erbsünde really means hereditary sin. That sin now uh, in in uh, to me this creates all kinds of problems. Uh, obviously. Original sin is a better term, and, and in Latin it is peccatum originale, but 
for Luther, I'm sure, since he was thinking very often in German, Erbsünde, hereditary sin, is the way in which he approached that. I find it uh, a less than helpful, actually. I prefer original sin to Erbsünde, to hereditary sin, yes? One of the things that seems to be coming more clear from, with Luther, and even to the point where he didn't want to debate about, you know, that Christ was always the cross, mm. that he thought more Hebrew as to why something happened rather than the Greek way of thinking how did it happen, so that he wouldn't have dissected even the virgin birth. No, I don't, no, I, I don't think, uh, but you see, we, we cannot jump out of history. What happened later on is, uh, you know, a couple of hundred years after Luther, is this whole rise of a kind of rationalism which does dissect everything and then and raises questions which to Luther seem uh, beside, totally besides the point. And, and so, uh, so you get, you get a, a, a rationalistic rejection of the, the basic teachings of Christianity to which you get a rationalistic response. And, and, and that, that is a story of, uh, of the last couple of hundred years. But, uh, but fortunately, we are dealing with Luther. And so I can, uh, I'm satisfied to tell it the, the way he saw it. Yes? Who knew Latin at that time of Luther? Who knew Latin? Was I mean, was it like it is now in the, I mean, with the mass? Latin? Yeah. Well, the priests knew Latin and any educated person, educated. any scribe, you know, anybody, uh, people like, the, the lawyers all knew Latin, the priests all knew Latin, but, and the kids in school learned Latin, you know, and if they went to school. That, 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 was a, that was very common, but, and, and he refers to that at a couple of times, when he talks about the boys, you know, uh, I, I, later on in this reading. But, uh, but the ordinary farmer, the, his wife, the, the, sir, the, 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 the knechte, the, 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 the hired men, they, they didn't know anything. And so the whole thing was a very peculiar performance, which they had great reverence for. But they had the foggiest idea what was going on. That was his problem. And he didn't even realize how bad it was until he started doing these visitations. And, and when we get in, if we ever do good to get there, if we get, to the small, <laughs> if we get to the small catechism, we will get to the very point now, since the situation is as desperate as I have discovered, Luther said, let's do something about it. Let's not just weep around that people don't know anything, but let's find a way to teach them. And so he comes up with this beautiful little book, which we know as a small catechism, in which he explains the basic elements of the Christian faith to people. And you will see when you read it, as we have done and as you've taught it, that he always makes this point for me. He doesn't say, this happened, period. But he says, it happened for me. Just as he doesn't say, God's kingdom is forever. He says, God's kingdom is ours forever. See, this the, the whole point of Luther is not to leave it up there in the never, never land as a true statement that doesn't involve me. It's a true statement that makes all the difference to me. And you see it never more clearly than in, in, in the small catechism. The small catechism is, is a concentrated Luther. We must so fear and love God. We must fear and love. I must fear and love God. And, and not, not, you see, it's not, he's not interested in making abstract statements. He's interested in making us part of God's pilgrimage, you know, the pilgrimage of God's future. Now, uh, the worst of news is God's word has not been preached in silence. Second is silly stories are told uh, that don't come from the Bible, that are human stories of funny things that happen uh, or not so funny things. Sermon illustrations. Yes. <laughs> no, no, I, mean, I, I, I mean here sermon illustrations. I have heard sermons where in a 12-minute sermon they used 12 illustrations. 
There wasn't anything else. I even knew the person that selected the illustrations for that basket. She was full-time employee, uh, <laughs> picking up stories that he would use. Disastrous preaching. There's nothing wrong with an illustration if you have one <laughs> or, or that, that really illustrates something. But very often, it's like my funny stories. They don't have anything to do with it. But I don't use them all the time. I don't use them in one every once in a while. Uh, third, such divine service was performed as a work whereby, whereby God's grace and salvation might be won. That's the, the other offense. That, that instead of making it <coughs> an uh, encounter with the living God who comes to us, the story, we are, we are making it into something like the Mass in which we present something to God. Uh, so he answers. Uh, by the way, the footnote you see about this Latin business I, I, that I, I mentioned. Uh, now in order to correct these abuses, first of all, Christian guys should never gather together without the preaching of God's word and prayer, no matter how briefly, as Psalm 2 1 says. Uh, the, uh, by that he means this preaching in the language that the people understand and the prayer in the language that the people understand. Uh, then, uh, and there should be pro prophesying, teaching, and admonition. Uh, he, he, uh, he then tries to explain that uh, in, in the following uh, material. And then he talks about the various services. Uh, apparently, he's still thinking about matins and vespers and all these services. And he also has certain very practical uh, uh, suggestions that the service shouldn't be too long. I don't know if you remember. At that point, we have taken Luther almost too seriously. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have come to the point where, where we think that unless it is, that the service ex exceeds an hour, uh, no, so, although um, uh, I have had teachers who said for, to a pastor after the first 20 minutes, no souls are saved. Uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the, there, is, there is something to be said, especially now in our time where the attention span of people has been confident. You have to remember that a hundred years ago, uh, people went to church, that was the only entertainment there was, you know. <laughs> they, they had no television, they had no radio, uh, there was no theater, the Chautauqua came around very rarely, and so the only excitement in the way of intellectual stimulation came from the sermon. And I know, I basically am a short preacher. You wouldn't believe it from my lectures, but basically <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm a short preacher. And I, when I preached in Africa, uh, people would complain if I preached only 20 minutes or 30 minutes. They had come a long way. <laughs> and, and they wanted something for their money or whatever it was. <laughs> they, they felt that if you can preach for an hour at least, uh, then, then you are not much of a preacher. And uh, and it is really a different, but you see, that's a different cultural setting. There is, there is no television. <laughs> and and the, the, the weekly sermon, and people travel for, for long, long distances and take a lot of time, and they don't do that to, for one hour. They do that, they, they want to spend the morning and the afternoon there and have a good meal in between. And, and, and this, this, this is it's a different setting. Now, you have to understand Luther in his own setting, and it is interesting that, uh, that he is uh, a good enough psychologist to realize that people do get tired, and that after a certain time, uh, you don't teach him very much, so he, he doesn't. And then he suggests, are there any other questions? I, I w might want to say something about the way he uses the term bishop. He often did not hear so much of the next reading. Bishop is for him pastor. Uh, the, 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 and that's probably pretty true to the way the word was used in the New Testament. Uh, the episcopate is oversight, and the oversight was the pastors. And uh, 
we didn't have this kind of very highly organized uh, situation in which uh, we have uh, deacons and uh, uh, pastors and, and uh, priests and bishops. Uh, uh, that the bishop is for Luther very generally uh, page 449 top of the yes I had a question on page 447 um, on the uh, second paragraph from the bottom where he says the daily masses should be completely dis discontinued for the word is important and not the mass is he referring to these little altars that they set right. up okay that's right and, and the mass which doesn't have any preaching and has a sacrifice in it. When he says mass, in a pejorative sense, it's always mass as sacrifice. He writes something which he calls the Deutsche Messe, the German mass. So he does use the term mass, and, uh, and uh, of course, it's essentially what is our service to them, you know, they, this, but he, he doesn't, and the Swedes never gave up the, the term mass for their service. In, in, in Swedish, the, the Sunday service is a messa, you know, it's it's a mass. And uh, the, 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 you know, that, that word is that, that from the end of the, of the service, we have missa es, you know, that, that's where the word comes from. What Luther objects to is not something that's called the mass, but what he objects to is a sacrifice that human beings make to God. That's <coughs> the object, the, the arrow from, <laughs> From, from the human being to God, and that's the objection. And otherwise, he has no objection to it at all. Yes? Luther would probably then also be opposed to the way the Episcopalians use the word Eucharist, the great Thanksgiving. Well, at, at in a Thanksgiving, uh, you know, in the, in, <laughs> in the service that you have in the joint effort of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and the, the ELCA, you know, that, 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 that book, there is a Eucharistic prayer which I can uh, only say I have some trouble with. And, uh, the, the, and because uh, it's a tendency to uh, <coughs> talk about our sacrifice of praise, prayer, and, and thanksgiving, and, and things like that. And I am too good a Lutheran, you know, to, I'm allergic to sacrifice in that sense. <laughs> I, 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 really, I really think uh, that belongs uh, into the, the uh, before, before that, uh, before the, the, the Holy Communion. Uh, the, the heavy, in, the, we, we can bring gifts and we bring the bread and the wine and money and whatever you want. Uh, that's perfectly fine, but we do not sacrifice to God uh, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where the problem comes. And I don't particularly like that this is somewhat confused uh, in my opinion. I'm not the only one. But, uh, that, that, that is it's not really helpful. But, uh, page 449. To the Venerable Dr. Nicholas Hausmann, Bishop of the Church in Sunka. Of course, he was a pastor of the Church in Sunka. And for Luther, that's the same thing. Uh, and then he sort of gives his advice on various and sundry subjects. Uh, it's not Luther's most orderly piece of writing, if you remember, if you have read it. He goes from one thing to the other, and he does not have necessarily a very uh, firm opinion. He says that you can do that. The pastor can decide. The bishop, the bishops and pastors can decide uh, how to do this. Uh, and uh, if you go through it, uh, you will see where he is, uh, what he's trying to emphasize. It has not been now or ever our intention to abolish the liturgical service of God completely but rather to purify the one that is now in use from the wretched accretions which corrupted and to point out an evangelical use. That's in the middle of page 450. Uh, the service of God, he writes that in Latin, cultus dei. By the way, uh, on the 
where the footnote number three is, that's in the first full paragraph, we will deal with an evangelical form of saying mass, as it's called, in a ministry community. Evangelical is a funny translation of uh, Luther's word pia, which means uh, godly. Uh, well, it, godly and evangelical <laughs> may mean, I, wouldn't, I would have translated it as godly. <laughs> I always translate pia, pius or pia as godly. Not as pious, because that is totally confusing. It doesn't, people don't mean, pious doesn't mean what pia <coughs> or pius means in, in Latin. And, uh, but godly would have been a perfectly uh, acceptable translation. And then he makes some suggestions about the reform of uh, this, the Holy Communion and, uh, uh, and, and makes also some historical comments, how it was done in the past. Uh, and then, of course, uh, he, uh, he objects strenuously to all these things that are, in his opinion, money-making schemes. Uh, much of this is an attempt to get people to pay, uh, and that all happened page 451, the fourth line from the bottom, when the mass became a sacrifice. That is for Luther the fall. The fall of the... Yes? Uh, historical question, the line above that, the canon, is this referring to a specific document now, historically? That's called the canon of the mass. How, when... when, when he makes it sound there like it was it was concocted at some point and pulled together. When did that happen? Well, it, it's over a long period of time this develops, and it doesn't isn't the same in every part of Europe and the deep side. But it, it, it becomes more and more. It's it's never in, in Luther's time never as firmly uh, written uh, written down as it becomes after the Council of Trent. You see, because of all these. <coughs> The, the, the French did it their way, the Spanish did it. There was a considerable difference in the way in which people uh, did the service. And uh, there were certain basic parts that were the same. But when, when somebody raised a question about the whole thing, then suddenly we, uh, we, we got a very firm uh, uh, written down rules that you have to do that. And then you have the ordinaries. The, 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 those parts of the mass are always to be repeated the same, and those that are different. You know, and then you have this whole liturgical development, uh, which uh, which got so bad so that eventually that in the 19th century, now I'm talking about Roman Catholic, the Benedictines finally took the whole mess on and started to redo it, and you get this tremendous liturgical reform. And today, as you know, if you go to the Roman Catholic Church, uh, you think you're in a Lutheran church. Uh, very largely, they are doing it in English, and they have thrown out a good deal of the things that do the ones who throw out uh, 450 years early. But uh, the, 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 uh, so there is, there is an amazing change, liturgical change. I think the, 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 the Second Vatican Council has done a great deal to make the Mass much more in line with the historical tradition. My wife and I visited the mission in San Juan about a year ago. And, of course, a very Catholic, I'm sure you've been down there, it's very Catholic in there and everything. And so we were looking through the hymnal. They had a mighty fortress in the hymn book, and they had a lift high the cross in the hymn book. <laughs> so very interesting. Yeah, they like to sing a mighty fortress. <laughs> and uh, uh, Luther wouldn't mind. <laughs> I mean, but, but you see, there is, there is in Roman Catholicism a real effort to get away from some of the accretions. Only you know, Luther said it in the, in, 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 too early. I mean, <laughs> it took a long time. But, but uh, it was as a result of some of his criticisms that some of these things were eventually put in a definite order that everybody used. But, of course, 
in Latin because, you know, the English service in the Roman Catholic Church didn't happen till the, your lifetime, not to mention mine. It, 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 was the, it was the Second Vatican Council that said um, the service ought to be in the language of the people. And as you know, there were some Roman Catholics actually were furious. And one bishop started his own church where he wanted to keep the Latin Mass. And I had a very good friend, an ophthalmologist, who uh, said to me, it's hard for me to go to church at Roman Catholic. I never minded the bad Latin of our priests. But his bad English is more than I can say. <laughs> <laughs> so you, 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 were, you were protected against the inadequacy. Not every priest is a great orator. Neither is every pastor, you know. And then you have a sort of, this was a very sophisticated person. He, he liked the English language. And he felt he was offended by the, by the uh, uh, primitive use of the English language. Yes. Well, the friends that I have too that are that are my age have absolutely no knowledge of the Bible because they've never studied the Bible, never had Bible studies at church. It was always in Latin. And so therefore they they just feel totally well they are, they're completely illiterate. Yeah. Well now they try to do something about that. They are beginning to teach the Bible in English to their people and uh, it all depends, you know, where you are. But you are right. For when when I was a young person, uh, the uh, Roman Catholic considered it sort of uh, uh, heretical to read the Bible. I mean, you, you only if the, you, that showed there were some Protestant tendencies in you <laughs> if, if you read the Bible. And, and uh, unfortunately, this has has changed. And as you know, some of the great biblical scholars of our time are Roman Catholics and, and have made major contributions, many of them Benedictines as a matter of fact, have had major contributions to, to, a, to, to the better understanding of the Bible. Great institute in, in Jerusalem that the Roman Catholics run. And I think that's all to the good. Uh, of course, when we read Luther, we are talking to somebody who is confronted by a situation that is disastrous. It, 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 the ignorance is so pervasive, and uh, you can see, and, and the whole thing is a money-making scheme. But it took forever to get that changed. Apropos, you brought up the Episcopalians. Uh, what is this novel about these preachers in, in England that you, that we watched on television that you like to read? The Lord of Ernest. I don't know. Okay. It, uh, it, you know what, what is that book you're reading right now, that you have right now? It's um, George Eliot's... Middlemarch. Middlemarch. In many of these 19th century English novels, you have preachers that play a big part who have a... Uh, Assignment to a church in, uh, in a big town in England. On the living. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then they hire some curate who does the services every Sunday in the winter. And they are on the Riviera. That's how it is told in these novels. That means, and that's the way it was in Luther's time. People got us assignments and they got the money from that and they could spend it any way they pleased and they certainly weren't going to stay in that dumpy town. They went somewhere else and let somebody else do the work for them. And, and, and it was this, but the sad part is that was still true in England in the, in the Anglican church in, in the 19th century. And, and this, this, is, this is the unbelievable part that what Luther is complaining about was so pervasive that it affected practically everybody and in, every, in all these countries. And you can see why people like the Mennonites and uh, said, we, we won't have anything to do with any of that. We'd start from scratch. Um, the, the 
amazing thing about Luther was that he considered this all salvageable. That you didn't have to throw out the whole thing. The most more logical uh, reaction would have been, this is so bad. We, we, let's go back to the New Testament and act as if the last thousand years hadn't happened. And uh, Luther didn't. He thought there was, we had, there was good music. He felt that there was good music that, that he could use. You could write, he said, you can write better words to it. <laughs> and and uh, we can write them in German, but we have to be careful that we really don't ruin the music by writing them. Because he was a musician, he wanted it to be done properly. And, uh, and he, he really uh, tried to salvage as much as he possibly could. And really did, because if you see his reforms, his liturgical reforms were in the mainstream of the Catholic tradition. And the whole thing didn't get uh, dissolved until um, rationalism. And this business, for example, of everybody uh, wearing only a black gown and the sort of getting dressed up like a judge uh, with the, 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 the defian, you know, with the, the tabs, the white tabs. This is all part of rationalism. That the, the, in, the, in the Luther's church, you still had the vest. If there were vestments, you used them. You didn't throw anything away, not, not Luther's. You, you, <laughs> you, you kept it and you used it as long as you didn't do any holy stuff with it. You know, Luther says, nothing wrong with vestments if you don't worship them or do, do uh, assume that they have some particular uh, theological meaning. But, uh, but he was quite willing, and of course, in, in those Lutheran churches which didn't have uh, a violin, where the bishops went along, like in, in, in Sweden, you, they wore the same vestments that they had worn before. You could do that as Lutherans and have a Lutheran theology. Vestments don't mean anything. I mean, my, my problem is not that people like vestments. My problem is that people like vestments too much, as if they were important. And they are. <laughs> and, and, and Luther made that very clear. But there's nothing wrong. There's nothing uh, wrong with using something that beautifies the service as long as the people aren't misled and think because you're all dressed up, you're different, you know, or, 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 or the, the whole business that that uh, that went hand in hand with some of these uh, these uh, vestments. So of course, when when I don't know what the Missouri Synod does now, but when I came to America, my my the Eastern churches that I belong to, none of them. We all wore black garments. Did you wear fancy vestments when you started? <clears throat> well, yes, but that was, <laughs> <laughs> but most uh, uh, in the 1930s they were still wearing black robes. Yeah, and that was very common. And uh, and uh, uh, I, I I remember distinctly once when I was supposed to preach at the synod convention, and they had all this stuff that was I looked so gorgeous, I thought I was only Catholic Cardinal. I had so many <laughs> things hanging on me. And I really didn't want to do it because I'm somewhat of a low church Luther. <laughs> and, and, that, and that was all on television, and I thought this is going too far. But then they knew how to get to the Luther, and they said to me, but we have already paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided I didn't want to waste their money, so I wore it anyhow. Uh, but it's not a theological point. You want to say something? Yeah, the Orthodox churches still uh, will use incense. They'll sense the altar, and then they'll priest will sense the congregation or whatever. Now, was that done a lot at Luther's time, and did he carry yeah. much of that over? I don't. I almost, Some of it is used still. It, it wasn't a big thing, but. And it was always different. But, well, you know, the Roman Catholic did an awful lot of that. And, and, and I remember as a kid, you know, being raised in Austria, that when I went past the church, the, the odor of sanctity came right out of the church. But, it, <laughs> but, but, but it, 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 there were all kinds of symbolism connected with it. And I, I, it's, again, something that is, in good Lutheran language, an adiaphora. It doesn't really matter, except if you make it matter. If people become and say, you cannot have a service without that, then you have a problem. 
then, 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 then you have to then you have to say yes, we can, and and and, and, and insist that this is not uh, of the essence of the church. And this is this is a this is a real problem uh, in, in in the practical application of all these things. Uh, he talks about uh, a number of liturgical things that may be of interest to you. Uh, uh, to the arrangement of the service, he takes a position that, that the uh, in Holy Communion the wine should be uh, pure wine and not wine mixed with water. That's a big point in the Roman Catholic Mass. Not wine is mixed with water, uh, and he thinks uh, uh, the explanation is bad. Uh, on page 456. In fact, we are not united with Christ until he sheds his blood, or else we would be celebrating the shedding of our own blood together with the blood of Christ shed for us. So he doesn't like the symbolism of this mixing before before Holy Communion. And then uh, he gives some suggestions how all this uh, uh, should be done. And uh, uh, I have a question on sure. that. Uh, what you were saying, in fact, we are not united with Christ until he sheds his blood. Why do some Lutheran pastors believe that the shedding of Christ's blood was not necessary, that he really didn't have to die? I don't know. Any, Where do they get that from? I don't know any Lutheran pastors that believe that, and they that I believe that they aren't Lutherans. <laughs> Amen. I mean, I, I, consider, I consider this of the essence mm -hmm. of the Christian faith. Scripture says that without the shedding of blood, there's no. Yeah, I just, I just, uh, I mean, I take your word for it, and I'm used to pain. I, <laughs> I, I know that there are all kinds of strange people around, but, but the, the, uh, anybody who denies that the atonement that Christ died for us, I don't think he's a Christian. Very nice people. Some of my best friends are. So he can't help that. that but I, 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 I tell you right out, if somebody says he's a Lutheran pastor and he, uh, he doesn't believe that Christ that is just blood for us, tell him to read the Book of Concord. I mean, which is a confession of the Lutheran Church, which he or she subscribed uh, if, if they are the king or the Lutheran Church. Well, my understanding was that that was the whole intent. I mean, he came to do just what he did. Right. So I don't know So I, I don't... I, 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 I just, I, I don't know anybody like that. I mean, nobody's said that to me. I know all kinds of pastors in other denominations who don't believe. But they don't, some of them don't even believe that Jesus Christ is some God, you know. I don't see to be a Christian that way either. So, so, so the, the, there are certain uh, uh, elements of the common Christian faith. In my book on the Protestant faith, I collect at the end uh, confessions of various churches including Baptists, and you will see that to everybody's surprise, the Baptists believe in, in, in this uh, atonement. And it's not, it, it is just when you have churches where every congregation makes up their own creed. You know, in, in certain traditions, like the Congregationalist tradition, everybody was allowed, you know, every congregation was made, allowed to make up their own creed. Uh, and that can end in disaster. Well, uh, let's uh, hurry on. Uh, the communion of the people uh, it, uh, on page 462. Uh, so far, we've dealt with the mass and the function of the minister or bishop. You see here, it says minister or bishop. So this the notion that the bishop is something different from the minister, he does not necessarily accept. And, uh, uh, then he talks about private conversion, but I don't think he says anything that we haven't found in the other parts that we have read. <coughs> and so I would skip over that to page 471, unless you have any particular question. Then on 461, we have the small catechism. And he says at the very beginning, the deplorable conditions which I recently encountered when I was a visitor 
constrain me to prepare this brief and simple catechism or statement of Christian teaching. And he describes them what a horrible experience it was. <laughs> not only did the common people not know anything, unfortunately many pastors are quite incompetent and un unfit to teach. Uh, and he uh, says we have to change that. And, uh, Dr. Perhaps? Yes. This is the preface, isn't it, of the catechism? No. Why is it in the back? of the Catechism today? <coughs> I think uh, it is because it is not particularly applicable to our situation. Or popular, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know, but... He uses you know, some pretty strong <laughs> language. <laughs> but probably very applicable today. Mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, but I think uh, basically it is a historical document. And uh, the Catechism proper Below, uh, begins on page 476 with the Ten Commandments. And there, just let me point out to you uh, that uh, he deals with the Ten Commandments in a very straightforward fashion. So that I know all kinds of people who are not Lutherans who have read these, this small catechism and found that it they had no problem. That's what <laughs> that's expressed their faith. You can read the whole small catechism through, and you find nothing where he waves a Lutheran flag. He just uh, states in very straightforward, simple language uh, what the, the Christian faith uh, consists of. And interestingly enough, and typically, he starts with the law. It, because he believes it is a law that drives us to Christ, you know. The, the, it, the law is the pedagogos, the taskmaster that brings us to Christ. And therefore he starts with the law and he finds in the Ten Commandments the perfect summary of the law. Now, uh, as you read it, and you all have read it, uh, He gives it a certain twist that uh, is interesting. Uh, the first commandment, obvious. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Second commandment, we should fear and love God and so we should not use his name to curse, swear, practice magic, lie, or deceive. But in every time of need, call upon him, pray to him, praise him, and give him thanks. Uh, he deals with this whole uh, tradition in which God's name is used uh, for uh, evil purposes. And that, of course, was a problem uh, for the Jews. And as you know, the Jews uh, simply avoided this by not pronouncing the name of God at all. Not in order not to use the name of God in vain, they said, we make sure of it, we don't want to use it at all. And since I had many Jewish students in the course of my career at Iowa, uh, many Jewish students would not write God in their tests. They would write G and make it a, a, make a mark and D to leave out the, 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 the word to, so that they wouldn't write God. As you know, uh, in the, the Hebrew Bible isn't written in Hebrew, <laughs> and, but Hebrew was written entirely in consonants and no vowels. And when the Jews came to the name for God, the letters for God, they used instead the word the Lord, Adonai. And when this language became um, obsolete, when it was only used as a liturgical language in the service of the Jewish community. People couldn't pronounce these words anymore without some help. And so some experts created the Masoretic text, which put vowels underneath the consonants. And so that 
that dummies like me could read these words because I knew what these vowel signs meant for me. That was nice. As you know what's coming is, what did they do when they came to the name of God? They put down the vowels for Adonai, for the Lord. When you put down the vowels for Adonai under the name of uh, what people, the experts claim was Yahweh or Yahweh, you got a funny word which no Jew had ever pronounced and which is a made up word of the consonants of Yahweh and the vowels of uh, the vowels of Adonai. And that is a word Jehovah. Jehovah is a word that doesn't really exist. It's a made up word of the consonant of one word and the vowels of another word. That's why Jehovah hasn't had a good press lately. You never find it very used. That once we figured out how we got it, we don't use it much. There's not wrong with the word Jehovah, but it isn't a very real word for God. It doesn't describe the name of God in the Old Testament. But the Jews never pronounced the name of God. And that's how they avoided to swear or abuse it. They, they, they do not, uh, they, they build a fence around the Torah. Now, uh, Luther does a strange thing with the Sabbath day. Uh, he does not do anything that the Jews would do or that the Reformed the Calvinists and others would do. Uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. First of all, he doesn't even say Sabbath day in German. He says the fire time. And uh, we, should so, we should fear and love God. So we should not despise his word. You, you keep the Sabbath by not and despising God's word or the preaching of the same. But deem it holy and gladly hear and learn it. For him, the Sabbath day is reverence for God's word and God's worship. <clears throat> and as far as not playing baseball or basketball, it means he doesn't get into that argument at all. That's not interesting to me. I, I think he wouldn't even understood it. Uh, when I came to Iowa first, uh, you couldn't buy beer on a Sunday, but you could buy it on all the other days of the week. And I always wondered how something which was okay on Monday wasn't all right on Sunday, <laughs> and if it was not all right. On, on Monday, on Sunday, it shouldn't be right. But this is a 